All right, it's time to catch up with Michael Tulip. Not a lot of basketball to break down. Mike, uh, is Illinois defeated Western Illinois last week. We got a lot of great basketball to look forward to as Illinois will be tested the next couple of weeks with a road trip to Rutgers. Um, obviously, FAU, which is playing really good ball right now in the Jimmy V Classic. And then you wrap up with a trip to Tennessee, who is pretty good, even though they've lost a couple of games in a row here to elite competition. But I want to ask you, as, as a player, when you get like one game, in, in 12 days. What is this stretch like for a player? Yeah, I, I think it gets a bit overblown because um, you're already practicing every day anyways, pretty much since the fall. You get in this rhythm of, of practicing. But yeah, the part where you don't have a game to, to mix in there, because what usually happens is there is a game and there's a light practice leading up to the game and there's a light practice uh, after the game. So I, I don't know. I don't know how they structure these practices over these over these 12 days. I just I just know when we were there, you typically have like a three day stretch and then you get an off day. The off day is really not an off day. Uh, you come in, you get shots up, you get treatment, because, again, the most important thing is for a lot of these guys, their health throughout the season. I mean, we saw that already with Nico Moretti and, and Coleman. And and then now you start you start thinking about some of these other guys. Uh, you need them to be healthy. You, you want to be, uh, you know, you want to be uh, mindful of of that uh, on the on the health side of things. I want to ask you about this stretch that that Illinois just had. Um, Dane Danger got got a lot of action against the lower level opponents. How much does success for Dane Danger these last three games matter moving forward? I I think it's really similar to last year. I mean, the first three games of the year last year, off the top of my head, I think it was Eastern, UMKC, and Monmouth. And he was like 17 a game and 17 and eight. And uh, we know what he can do uh, against those types of teams. I think for Dane, where things changed last year was defensively. And it was, I, I'd like to call him a freshman last year because he, he didn't get a ton of time at Baylor, but being mindful that when you're in this, when you're in drop coverage, it's not about your one-on-one -on -one matchup. You have to stay in drop coverage for it to work, for to, to give yourself enough time or to give the guard enough time to come over the top and square back up the ball handler. And there were just times last year, and it wasn't really until he played Zach Eady, Hunter Dickinson, Trace Jackson Davis, that he started to become like, get back to my man conscious. And that just, it completely breaks down your defense. And all these kind of tough twos that they want to force are tough twos because the five man is dropping to where you're forcing shots over them and not around them like Braden Smith was doing in Mackey last year. So that's the challenge for him um, defensively. And you have to make free throws. You just you like you just have to 26 percent right now, which has gone up. <laughs> He's made four of his last six. Yes. Yeah, it's gone up over the past over the past couple of games. But um, there's just always going to be a ceiling for a guy that can't make free throws at a high level, especially late game. So he's got to figure that out. He's there's no question he's talented. There's no question he brings um, value to this team, especially when you talk about beginning of games where you can actually establish paint touches and getting throwing the ball into the post and racking up some fouls for the opposing team to maybe send yourself into the bonus halfway through the half. So, like I said, a lot of value for Dane, but some areas that he can patch up. But we know what he can do against the mid-major guys. Yeah. On the negative side for Quincy Garrier so far this season, Mike, one of 18 from three might have something to do with the, the wrist, uh, four of nine from the free throw line. But he's 68th in the country in defensive rebound rate, 254 and I believe he's 95th, 98th percentile, something like that, in defense. Now, Illinois has not played the toughest schedule yet outside of Marquette, but what has he brought to the team? Yeah, I think he plays big, and there's a lot of guys that are 6'8", are 6'9", six, six, that step out onto the perimeter and play like they're 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six. and he really does play like he's 6'8", he's 6'9". Six, six, and look, I, I think the shooting is going to rectify itself if you continue to take good ones and he does, I, I think for the most part, the threes that he's taken this year have all felt, I, if I envision them in my head, I'm sure people listening to this, you picture Quincy in the corner wide open for a three. Um, and, and if, and if he continues to take that quality of shot, 
then the water is going to find its level. It, what, what you can't have for him is a drop off in the effort that he gives both defensively and rebounding right now because his shot's not falling. That's always the challenge for, for college basketball players is when things are really rolling offensively, how in tune are you to what's going on defensively still? I mean, Dre Gibbs Lawhorn is a, is a great example where, you know, if you, if you're trying to stay on the floor and you know, Oh, I got to defend because I'm not doing what, you know, I'm not making shots offensively. Well, now when you're making shots offensively, are you still defending? Cause, mm -hmm. cause the defense is always going to be needed. So for Quincy, it's the same thing. And that's what I'll be monitoring going forward, but having a guy like him with size and that can rebound like that in this upcoming three game stretch, especially when you head to the rack, it's, it's imperative. Marcus Damask had 18 points, three of seven from three against uh, Marquette, one of the best teams in the country, a true final four contender. Uh, the other games he's made three uh, of 18, I believe from the three point line, doesn't have more than eight points in a single game. Any concern with Marcus Damask uh, against these lower level opponents? I don't have concern, but you know, at some point it's like, hey man, we got to go. Like we got, we got to get going. We talked about who that second person is going to be, and I've talked about it before. It's not necessarily going to reflect in production every night, but it should be in just the threat that you pose to the other team because that's just going to help out Terrence Shannon. Yeah, I mean, you're gonna you're gonna run Terrence Shannon into the ground if you can't find other guys on this team that can step up and alleviate some of that for him. So Marcus is, is no exception. I think um, it's noticeable for whatever reason. Um, he played with a certain level of aggression and self-assurance, I guess, against Marquette. And then all of a sudden in these ex or these uh, non-conference other non-conference games, it's, he looks timid yeah. and I'm not really sure what that is. Maybe that's, a product of him not fully understanding what his role is. Like, hey, am I kind of point guard handling it? Or do you want me to be more like the spacer, catch and shoot guy? I mean, and I think Coleman Hawkins is going to help a lot with that. Because when Coleman Hawkins comes back, it's it's going to be much less ball screen oriented and more of what they did against Kansas and somewhat against Marquette with some of these, these split screen actions that they were running. And I think that unlocks a little bit more of Marcus's ability to cut and and just be a basketball player. Um, so I don't know. We'll see as this goes on if it's just, hey, is there too much on his plate right now or 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 what? So um, but they need him to they need him to get going. They need him to be consistent in his um aggression offensively every night. Even if he doesn't feel like he has it going, he needs to to come off ball screens looking to score. Um, because that's the only way you're gonna draw in defense and and, and not doing what he's doing right now, which is kind of coming off and taking these like two token dribbles to just swing it. That just, that's, that's wasted offense. So if he can figure that out, they'll be, they'll be in a much better space offensively, but I think it'll put, I think it'll put Terrence Shannon in a better place too. Mike, you mentioned Coleman Hawkins missed the last three games, um, resting that, that knee Underwood said something like tendonitis. Um, so I would imagine he's feeling a little bit better with all the treatment he's had. How do you expect Illinois to work him back in? What, what should we expect? with him coming back and all of a sudden here's Rutgers and Cliff Omarui if he if he's back for Rutgers. Yeah, I think if his health is where it needs to be, if he if he is truly close to 100%, I, I think you need to start him. Uh, I think Dane is still pretty potent off the bench. He gives just a change up, right, where you can start throwing the ball in and it's it's really interesting because you're you're going to need the you know what they've what they've had defensively you're going to need it against Rutgers because on the flip side you know Illinois has been the best two point defense in America to this point Rutgers is second now Illinois probably played a better schedule and that's saying something because outside of Marquette they haven't played strong competition but you know the best team that Rutgers played is is Princeton. Mm -hmm. And and then like I'll put Princeton over Georgetown. There's there's no question. But yeah, for Coleman when he comes back, I mentioned the split actions. More the you can do more things offensively with him, and then defensively, I don't know. Do they get to the point where they start switching things again, or do they keep Coleman in, in drop coverage? Because um, he's really good at it. He's had some moments where he's he's been shaky early on, which is uncharacteristic of him. But the hope is that when he comes back, that his health allows him to continue this defensive pace that they've been at, uh, limiting teams and enforcing tough twos. And 
he's the proof of concepts there with Coleman that he's been a big part of that over the years. And it's a big reason why they've been um, towards the top uh, of the list in terms of defensive teams in the country. You've heard us talk about home field apparel since the start of the season. There are a lot of collegiate apparel brands out there, but we wanted to partner with home field because their designs are the best out there. Some of Illini Enquirer's favorites are the basketball ringer tee, the rose tee, and the 1980s long sleeve with the script Illini. It's great. Be sure to check out homefieldapparel.com, filter by Illinois, and see what we're talking about. And our listeners get an exclusive deal using code Illini23. Using that code Illini23 gets you 15 percent off your first order we all know you're wearing a line ag gear so if you're in need of a refresh we really think that you should check out home field apparel which has the best designs and these shirts guys are really comfortable their designs are super unique and a lot of thought goes into each concept there's really nothing else on the market like what home field is doing you can find them at homefieldapparel.com and use code align 23 for 15 percent off your first order at homefieldapparel.com mike you and i both think this defense can be pretty good uh, Rutgers offense is not great, but uh, we know Tennessee can put up some points if, if they need to. Dalton connects a heck of a player. FAU's got a phenomenal offense. Um, how much are we going to learn? Like, what do you expect out of this defense in these next three games? You're going to learn a lot because these, I mean, th- these three teams, all three of them play extremely hard. Like, Ted is there. They hang their hat on, on toughness. And we, we've talked about Rutgers, you know, how hard it is to go win at the rack. Um, But FAU, you know, aside from the one game, the blip on the radar, which was dropping a, you know, 61 52 loss to Bryant. uh, They just didn't shoot it. Well, I think they were two for 17 from three. Uh, Didn't shoot it well from two either. They turned it over a little bit, Uh, but they have just been running teams out of the gym since then. I mean, uh, you beat Texas A&M, you beat Butler, and then you you beat Virginia Tech by 34. And in all three of those games, you watch it. I mean, th- that is w- – yes, we saw the Final Four. We know what they're capable of. But these are high major guys, man. Mm-hmm. They've had a couple transfers. I mean, their they're leading scorer, their big man, came from Texas Tech after his freshman year. They had, One of their other guards came from Minnesota after his freshman year. They have another one that spent two, three years at UConn. Uh, but those guys aren't even – some of those aren't even like their real impact players. Their big man is, but they're – I mean, Elijah Martin and uh, Nick Boyd and, and uh, John, L., uh, John L. Davis, they are just like high, high major guys. And it's a credit to Dusty May because how he was able to retain those guys and keep them out of the portal – because you know how this works nowadays. There are teams back-channeling and, and making calls and offering money, and uh, they play like they want to be around each other. They always make the extra pass. They're always putting pressure on the defense. They they just they they make the right play, and it puts you in such a bind. So this defense that we, you know that we're talking about for Illinois is going to be put to the test. And then Tennessee, you just naturally over the years have thought of Tennessee as a team that's just this grind it out, rock fight type of, type of team. And we'll see what Dalton Connect's health looks like. That looked pretty nasty last night. The the ankle injury that he had. Uh, but they've just added different pieces to this team that now they can all of a sudden go and hang 85 on you. And, yeah. and um, I just, I fully expect over these next three games for teams to be physical with Illinois too. You haven't shot free throws well. So what's your worry about sending a team to a, to the bonus that's shooting 56% from the free throw line. So if you're Terrence Shannon, if you're Marcus Damask, you got to get over 70%. You got to start connecting at a, you know, at a higher rate. And um, and you're going to give yourself the chance to win if you do that. And, and look, two of these are going to be road games, and we'll see. Florida Atlantic, they looked like they trapped. I mean, I know it was in Orlando, their their Thanksgiving tournament. That was like a home game for them. Those games that they played down there. So we'll see if if some of the Boca folks make their way up to to New York. But you you have three challenging games ahead of you, and you know you don't want to make predictions in December and say, Hey, if they go three and zero in these games, they're going to win the national championship or Hey, if they go on Oh, for three in these games that the season is doomed. Right. But you know, it's probably going to be somewhere in the middle there. I I'd expect like a two, two and one, one and two, probably uh, three and zero would be perfect world, but uh, you certainly don't want to drop all three of these games. Yeah. You want to win some games here. That is for sure. Uh, on the offensive side of the ball, Mike, I, I mean, 
Luke Goody and Terrence Shannon have combined to shoot 45% from three. Uh, they're atop the Big Ten and three-point makes per game. So that's been a positive, but we know uh, this offense has challenges. So what are you looking for most on that side of the ball against a Rutgers team that defends FAU? Maybe not, maybe the worst of these three, but Tennessee can really get after it defensively. What are you looking for on that end? Yeah, I mean, these games, you're going to have to make shots. It's going to come down to it to where you're not able to get into the paint and now you got to rely on maybe it's late clock threes or, or getting downhill inside out on the road. It's defensive defense and rebounding for sure is what has to travel, but making shots. If you, if you hang in the fifties and low sixties, it's going to be, it's going to be really hard to, to win these games. And then for, for Terrence and Luke, they've both been shooting it extremely well. Uh, Luke, I, I think if he continues to shoot good ones, it, he'll, he'll end up in the low forties, I think for the season. I think he's, he's just that good of a shooter. Terrence, I would be pretty shocked if he ended the season over 40, and that's that's nothing against him. I think he just – he is – he takes tough ones. And then it's it's always – it's my theory of NBA point guards as well and point guards in general. People that handle the ball late clock often have to hoist yeah. threes at the end of the shot clock. So I think if, if Terrence ends the season – in that 36 to 38 range, that's a that's a huge yeah. win. Yeah. And also, if he becomes that hovering around 40 guy, maybe teams stop going under uh, on these ball screens for him. And if they yeah, if they stop going under now, now it unlocks a little bit more of his ability to get downhill because I think you you've seen it in transition with him, but you probably haven't seen it as much as you'd like to in the half court. And that's because these teams are going under. So he's popped behind and, and made you pay from three, but you know, maybe even if he shoots it well, though, these these teams are still just so worried about his ability to put pressure on on you know at the rim that they just continue to go under anyways. And if they do that, he's going to have to continue to make them pay from three. So, and then just schematically for for them, if Coleman's back, I mentioned, do you go back to some of these split actions that you went to against against Kansas and against Marquette, or do you try to work in some more ball screens? I just Again, I don't. I don't think this is a ball screen team. I think you can set some, but I, I just don't think that that's going to be the bulk of your actions. More, you know, maybe it's it's stagger screens, away screens for Terrence to have him coming with a head full of steam. Um, they've done some of these zoom actions where it's a pin down into a dribble handoff. I, I really like those for Terrence to where you can get separation initially off the screen to where they, you know, maybe they have to fight over to to try to catch back up to Terrence. So just a variety is what's needed. I think you have talented enough players, but these guys, Quincy, Justin Harmon, Dre, Gibbs Lawhorn, you got to come in, you got to start making shots. That was a luxury that this team had over the years. Trent had to do a lot off the dribble, but Jacob Grandison, Alfonso Plummer, uh, you know, these were, these were guys that could step in and, and make catch and shoot, catch and shoot shots and opens up the paint and opens up what you can do overall offensively. So um, especially in three games where you're away from home. I mentioned the defensive rebounding, but you have got to connect uh, on some of these outside looks. Mike, I was going to ask you, on the flip side, Illinois provides a challenge to all these teams, right? Rutgers is the best opponent they'll play all year so far. Uh, that's been a house of horrors here recently, 0-3 in the last three for Illinois. Ford Atlantic, this would be among their top couple games so far with Texas A&M being up there. And then Tennessee has had a ridiculous schedule. Their their last three games, Purdue, Kansas, North Carolina, they also beat Wisconsin. But um, what what challenges do you think Illinois will provide all three of these teams? Uh, well, it starts defensively. Um, you know, and, and Terrence Shannon offensively is going to be one of the better players that all three of these teams have have played. But defensively, it's it's really interesting to to look at the makeup of this Illinois team and what makes it so challenging to play against them. Because when you look over the past few years, they are like 300 plus in the country in forcing turnovers. First couple of years of Brad Underwood, they were, you know, I think one year they were fourth in the country. Another year they were top 25. This isn't an Illinois team, an Illinois team that's going to turn you over. And sometimes that can be a challenge with a really good defensive team is that that's baked in there as well is, Hey, you know, we're playing West Virginia. We got to really take care of the ball. Illinois doesn't force turnovers, but what they do force, like we talked about, is tough twos yep. and just the ability to have these unassisted end of possessions where teams are, are taking shots off the dribble and having to shoot over guys. And it's all it's all predicated on their on their ball screen coverage and their ability to 
uh, to stay in front of their their man and, and get just a contest on the shot. And I think they've done a much better job this year when you have more length, when you have more size on the ball. There's less of that, hey, coming over to alleviate and jump up and try to, to block shots from the weak side because that's taking you out of rebounding position. So they've done such a good job of that this year, doing that to opponents. But what does the sample size look like now after these three games where you've played teams that are capable – offensively uh you just you just haven't seen much of that i know the oakland game aged well because they were able to knock off xavier um xavier's a little bit down this year Mm -hmm. but yeah i mean it's it's that's what makes them so difficult is how sound they are defensively it's not this chaotic oh my god heat in the kitchen pressing you turn you over defense it is just methodical get over the screen, drop coverage, force a two, rinse, repeat. And over the course of the game, like we talked about, you, know, you may get off in the first five minutes, you hit a couple pull-ups, but the analytics and just you know percentages show that over the course of a game, those aren't high percentage looks. They, you know, The ones should be from the three-point line and at the rim. Uh, Illinois has just done a great job of, of limiting those two things. And if they continue to do that, they're going to give themselves a chance to, to have a successful early December. This episode of the Illini Enquirer podcast is presented by Underdog Sports. We see a lot of you are downloading Underdog Sports, using the promo code, and having fun, which we love to see. If you haven't already checked out Underdog Sports, be sure to do so. It's super easy to use. You go on the app, go pick whether favorite players will have a higher or lower stat total than what is listed. For example, Travis Kelsey, he's very popular these days. If his number is set at 50 receiving yards, and you know Taylor Swift is in the house, you may feel confident he's going to go way higher than the number. Do that with two to five different players and you're in business if you go five for five you can 20x your money so sign up today with promo code Illini and get your first deposit doubled up to $100 visit underdogfantasy.com or find them in the app store and don't forget to register with promo code Illini to get your first deposit doubled up to $100 there are a lot of fantasy companies out there but we decided to partner with underdog because it's the easiest place to play fantasy sports it's also the fastest growing fantasy app in the industry you must be 18 or older and present in a state where underdog fantasy operates terms apply concerned with your play call 1-800-522-4700 or visit www.ncpgambling.org besides fairly dickinson on december 29th nothing is easy the rest of this schedule mike i mean colgate on december 17th missouri December 22nd, uh, I mean, maybe Minnesota at home late in the season uh, could be one of those, but they got some talent. Um, but, you know, we hear all this talk about chemistry and, and playing together and, and this team's together. This is where we find it out. Oh, yeah. Like, this is where the adversity hits. I, I don't think any of us expect Illinois to go 3-0 and here. Maybe they do. But this is going to be a tough month where this team is putting adversity. Uh, how, how much will we learn a, a, about that factor? Yeah, I'm I'm calling the Fairleigh Dickinson game uh, on the 29th for for Big Ten Network, and I'm already starting some prep for that. And I'm sitting here thinking, man, what's it going to look like? Because yeah. it could be really, really good. It could be really, really bad, or it or it you know could be somewhere in the middle. But again, we talk about this three game stretch. You you could go three and oh, you yeah. could go three and oh, two and one, and feel like you're on top of the world. Or you could be 0-3, and, and then now you're – it's not like, hey, we got this December 17th game against a 300-plus Ken Palm team. This is Colgate, man. I mean, Colgate was up 24 on Syracuse earlier this year. They ended up blowing that game. But they have been just a thorn in the side of high major teams over the years. So you're going to have this, this uh, road trip in a sense and then come home and play a Colgate team that is going to put you in action after action and test your discipline – defensively and test your discipline offensively so uh, and then you know i believe the next one would be bragging rights right yeah so yeah and mizzou mizzou dropped one to jackson state okay. we, know how, we know how that game goes <laughs> we know how that game goes so yeah i mean we're gonna we're gonna learn a lot here in december and you just you don't want to see this team splinter and you don't want to see this team fray because that's exactly what happened last year exactly what happened successful early December, you knock off Texas, you had already knocked off UCLA. Hey, we're on top of the world. And then man, Alabama A&M got ugly. Press conferences were weird. Uh, you know, and then, and then you, you get, you get whacked by Missouri. And then now you're like, okay, well let's start big 10 play. 
and Northwestern, you know, hangs it on. So this, it just, it, it can spiral and spiral out of control quickly. Now you have some more, you have older guys this year. So you hope that that won't be the case, but we talked about this early portion of December, December in general is, is going to be a mammoth for them. So uh, I'm curious to see how they, uh, how they just get through this. Um, Cause we always say, right. You, you, you think best case scenario, you think worst case scenario odds are right. It, it'll, it'll likely be somewhere in the middle, but if you run through December, it's like, Hey, all right, it's on. And our, and your only loss at that point is to Marquette. So I'm really curious because it's, it's going to tell all of us a lot about the, the makeup of this team, both from a, just a schematic standpoint, but also what type of toughness do you have? And, and psychologically, um, can you can you move on from one game to the next, both whether it's a win or a loss? Mike, before I let you go, I want to ask you a little bit about the Big Ten at large here. Um, I think we all knew Purdue was going to be good. I, I picked yeah. pick them to win the conference. But uh, I, I'm not going to call that they're the next Virginia, 16 seed loss to a, a national championship. But I think they're capable. Uh, they look different. How do you think they look different? Yeah, I, I mean, I think Lance Jones has been a, a tremendous pickup for them. Last year, you, you wondered about that backcourt at times, and late in the season, David Jenkins was was a guy that provided at least a little bit of a spark. But man, Lance Lance Jones from a as a two way guard has has been extremely impressive. And I mean, we know what Zach Eady brings. Lawyer, lawyers are just fascinating to me. The freshman to sophomore year jump usually is coincides with a you know adding more physically, mm-hmm. and he just looks like the same dude. Uh, I mean, the exact same guy, and he's still able to to go and make an impact in these games. And uh, Braden Smith, I think, is still probably a little underappreciated as a point guard nationally. Uh, but but yeah, Purdue's Purdue's been in its own league, and I honestly, you could probably say that nationally. It's not that's not even just in the Big Ten. And I think you're exactly right. Where you you look at that 2019 Virginia team that you know ended up losing to uh, UMBC. Um, and then is able to go and uh, win the national championship. I think that's a, that's a hundred percent on the table for Purdue this year. Um, but but yeah, you look at the the rest of the Big Ten. I think Ohio State has been impressive. I, I talked about them as a team, a bit of a dark horse before the season, and not not from the standpoint of winning the league, but being better than four and sixteen. Yeah. Uh, now they've they've really turned things over to Bruce Thornton and. I, I think Bruce Thornton was a five star, and he's uh, he's playing like it. He's been outstanding. He's been he's he's been a, playing like a first team All Big Ten type of guy. So yeah, I picked him as a, a breakout player, even though he averaged ten points a game last. Year. I just thought he could be the best guard potentially in in the, in the Big Ten. And uh, Ohio State, I know they they dropped one there early, and, and Oakland gave him a run. Texas A and M, they lost two at home, but uh, that team looks like a legit contender at least. No, they've been good. And and Jamison Battle, we, we've seen what he's done at Minnesota over the years. Now you see how powerful it can be having a guy that's maybe a first option, first, second option for a team that's that's not that great. And then now he's a third, fourth option for a team that's that's a little bit better. And his just his attributes are accentuated where he's great catch and shoot. He can do some things off the dribble. He uses his size um, to, to back you down at times. And uh, so they they have a variety, and I, I love their front court too because they can play multiple styles, kind of similar to to Illinois um, yeah. with Coleman Hawkins and Dane Danger. But this is different. Like Felix Akpara is a rim runner, a lob threat, uh, a guy that's just so good defensively. And then you have Zed Key, who you can throw it into the post. He also is is solid defensively and is kind of air traffic control back there. So they they got a lot of options. And Roddy Gale. Shoot, I mean, he looks like one of the more improved players. He had a, he had a big Big Ten tournament last year, and both him and Bruce Thornton have kind of taken that into this year. And then you look you look around the rest of the league. I think Michigan State is going to go from overrated to underrated here yeah. at some point. Uh, Tom Izzo's already making some changes to the lineups. Uh, I I don't know AJ Hoggard. I, I would imagine eventually is going to get back into the starting lineup, but he didn't start in their last game. Um, and then Nebraska, right? I think Nebraska at this point is is unblemished, and they, I think they they do have a game coming up against against Creighton. So we'll see what that looks like. Michigan looked promising at the beginning of the year, and, and they just can't guard anyone right now. I'm not sure what Indiana does well. 
Um, I, really, I, I just I, they're I, big. I don't know. They're they're big, but they just, there's not enough skill. Like I, I can't believe what are we year three with Mike Woodson, and there's just not enough skill in that backcourt. No, there oh. isn't, and and it's and it's yeah, it's a shame because it feels like you have talent, mm-hmm. but you know you look at when you had Trace Jackson Davis, great player, but they were up and down with Trace Jackson Davis, and then all of a sudden you come in and bring a Jalen Hood Shafino in, and it's like whoa, all right, talented and skilled, can come off of ball screens, can make things happen, can go and get his game on if he needs to. And and that kind of raised the level of everyone around him. And now Xavier Johnson, like I just – we've talked about it over the years. Like if he's going to be a higher volume guy, I, I'm not sure you can right. – I'm not sure you can win a ton of games. And and they're just going to have to be – their identity right now is Malik Renu and Khalil Ware. And that's that's kind of it. Throw it in and can we be efficient down low and – and try to disrupt things defensively. I I don't know. I'll be really curious to see what things look like for them because right now they're just they're 78th nationally offensively, 79th nationally defensively, and it's, uh, it's and they, throughout the league too, Mike. I mean, we talk about Illinois. Can they shoot? Can they score enough? Do they have enough guards? And then Maryland has one of the best guards in the country in Jameer Young. Just to have no shooting around him. Deshaun Smith, Harris Smith, the, the freshman, is really talented. He's one for 19. That's a team I, I thought can compete for the Big Ten title, but their offense is just atrocious right now. It, and it's it's stunning because it felt like when you came into this season, there were a lot of new faces around the league, and you at least felt like with Maryland there was some carryover. Three of the better players in the Big yeah, Ten. Okay. Yeah, yeah, Jameer Young, Dante Scott, Julian Reese. Okay, that's – that's one of the better cores in in the Big Ten. So I think that's why a lot of people pencil them up there and kind of the top four would be competing in the top four of the Big Ten. That's not to say they can't still do that. We've seen teams turn it around. But, yeah, I mean, it's it's a it's a massive, massive head scratcher because, you know, we, talk, we just talked about Indiana shooting 24% from, from three. Maryland's 23. And, and they're both 350-plus – in the country. Now, Maryland, maybe they get their footing under them. Their next four games, Indiana, Penn State, Alcorn State, and Nickel State. So maybe they can string together some wins and all of a sudden you're eight and three and, and everything's okay going into going into a UCLA game at the end of December. But I think, you know, even with Indiana, it, it does not really get easier for them. Um, their December, we talk about Illinois' December, Maryland, they got next. And then they got Michigan at Michigan. Who knows with that game uh, <laughs> between those two teams? And then they play Auburn and Kansas. Um, it's it's so you'll find out a lot not only about Illinois but the Big Ten. Yeah. Uh, this this uh, November was not good to the Big Ten. Yeah. Another another big one that we can that you can circle your calendar. I think December sixteenth we got Purdue Arizona. Yeah. Um, that is going to, that is going to be. High, high, high level. Purdue's got Alabama on the summer ninth as well. Yeah. Like, yep. yeah, they. I mean, they got a heck of a, a heck of a non-conference. And if I was them, I'd, I'd do the same thing because you feel like you got the best team in the country right now, and you feel like you got, just like Illinois felt with Kofi Coburn. Yeah. You're like, man, we have an advantage, damn near every time we go into a game. Yeah. And and that's Zach Eady. And and when you when you factor in these other pieces that are that are coming along, even some of the young guys that they have. I mean, Miles Colvin is a guy that, you know, is, has been deer in the headlights in some games, but you can tell that the talent's there. And if he, if he becomes additive and um, you still have Ethan Morton somehow, uh, <laughs> not sure how Mason Gillis, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mason Gillis, same thing. Uh, so they, they feel like, yes, very reminiscent of, of 2019 Virginia. Um, but, I mean, every one of their players is, I mean, Edie doesn't shoot them. Every one of their players is shooting like 35% from three or better. Like, yeah. And part of that is you know, their lowest at 33%. But yeah, yeah, part of that is a product of, of Zach Eady. Sure. It's, it's very much, you know, when, when Kofi was here and all of a sudden you're like, oh, Demonte Williams is shooting 55% from three. And Grandison was always at 40 because they always, they could constantly get quality looks. I just, I don't see when you're watching Purdue, do you ever watch him and be like, man, that was a horrible shot they just took on the perimeter? No. Brandon Newman's gone. Um, so, so, you know, they, they just don't have that. It's all inside out. Even Trey Kaufman Wren is stepping out and making threes at first. You're like, Oh man, are they going to do this? Like Oh, four Detroit Pistons put both these guys on the block. 
Yeah. At first, I was like, I think this this doesn't help ED. And then now he trick off and runs stepping out and making threes. So I I don't know what you do with that team, really. I think you you eventually they're gonna probably have to go single coverage on ED for some of these teams. If you can pull it off, you have to go single coverage and just hope to God that they don't make shots from the outside. But that that itself sounds like a death. Scary defense. as hell. Scary yeah. as hell. Well, Michael Two up December is a fun time for college basketball. We'll learn a lot about all these teams, especially Illinois. We'll catch up next week in the middle of all this, probably after FAU, when we know a lot more. Uh, thanks, as always, for filling us in, man. Yeah, we'll learn a lot here in the next few weeks. Uh, looking forward to it, man.